Fantastic. Well, it's wonderful to have you all here at the same time on stage, flying in from around the world. So thanks for being here today. Uh, so let's just go ahead and dive into it. I know we have some limited time. Uh, some argue that Bitcoin will be where the, um, the highest value NFTs will be stored ultimately due to its longevity and uh, the high, high fees associated. So do you agree with that? And, and do you think that... Um, that there's other values that we can see around ordinals beyond longevity. Uh, Chris, perhaps we'll, we'll start with you. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think, um, you know, there's a variety of factors that, um, that determine uh, a token's value. Uh, and certainly permanence and mutability is one of the most important factors, but it's not the only factor. Uh, liquidity, you know, network effects, extremely important. So, um, you know, Bitcoin being permanent is not enough. We need to have people using the network for inscription specifically uh, and you know, have, the, have the distribution mechanisms in place. We need the infrastructure to make it easy for people to onboard. If we're able to do that along with the immutability, then certainly I, I think uh, Bitcoin is the destination for the highest value inscriptions. Yeah, certainly. And, and do you think, um, Robert, for ordinals uh, specifically, do you think there's value uh, for them beyond longevity as well? Yeah, I think so. Um, just the network effects of Bitcoin, you know, it's high like market cap as as you noted. Um, I do think it just makes it for makes for an interesting place to build like apps just beyond uh, you know artifacts. As as good as it is to have artwork, you know, it's it's really taken us uh, here to date. Um, I'm certainly bullish on, uh, frankly, things like BRC20, um, other kind of like app layers, you know, coming on, you know, that probably hopefully are a little less uh, uh, inefficient, right? <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think it, 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 the strong network effects definitely make it a, a good place to build apps and very excited what the future holds there. Jamil, your thoughts? Yeah, I'll, tell, I'll tell a quick story. So we, we, we've been building on like, we've had you know, Stacks creator tools, Ethereum creator tools. We, we started sort of in this 2021 you know, bull run where everybody was focusing on what's, what's the next L1? You know, there's Near, Avalanche, Solana. Everybody's trying to launch their own chain to do their own thing. And you kind of saw the markets evolve in quite similar ways. You know, we'll have you know, this collection on Solana and a basically copycat on Ethereum and a copycat on Avalanche and a copycat on Near, And we sort of saw those same patterns and trends in creator tools. And when we launched our inscription service, uh, when, when ordinals were first gaining traction, I mean, this was around, you know, we first experimented at num inscription number like 600, launched, you know, around 10K. And we we're sort of expecting the same thing, right? We expected basically people will use this in the same way that they've used NFTs in the past. And that wasn't the case, right? For the first time, you saw people using inscriptions in a vastly different way than they would normal NFTs in other chains. And one story that I told yesterday is our first bug report. The first bug report we ever got from our inscription service was someone who was like, my text is too long. Right, my, my inscription. And I'm like, what, what are you, in, what, what, like how, what, what, like, what are you putting, uh, like what are you doing? And he's like, well, I was trying to inscribe 1984, the book by, by George Orwell. And wait, would you see anybody do that on Solana or on Ethereum or like somewhere? No, there's no reason to do it. But this book meant so much to him. He was willing to pay hundreds of dollars to put this on the Bitcoin blockchain and preserve it for all time, right? And I think that's, that's kind of a, like, example of what makes Bitcoin unique, what makes inscriptions unique. And of course, you're going to see people bring in things from Ethereum, from Solana, and these things will be successful, right? BRC20 collections, inscriptions. But I think what leverages the unique value propositions of Bitcoin is really that permanence, those, those cultural artifacts. Some of it won't even be secondary sales or secondary trading. We saw people inscribe their family photos. We saw people inscribe their poems. We saw people inscribe their childhood memories. And this was just beautiful to see. So I'm, I'm super excited to see how this, the, you know, ordinals will develop, going back to like Ragnar's introduction. Um, and and I I'm just couldn't be more excited to see something different and something new emerge. Yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, that was such a perfect way to set the stage. Um, Ragnar's int introduction to give us the gravity of, of what we're doing here uh, with, on ordinals. 
and and also I, I believe even the Bible has been inscribed. So it's just amazing to see what uh, you know the most some of the most important artifacts in human history are, are being put on there. I personally put some uh, uh, classical music, some Rachmaninoff sheet music on there. So um, yeah, I think there's ways to have fun with it as well. Uh, John, John, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, I mean, I just build on what uh, Jamil said. Like Ragnar, I think you're totally right. The digital artifact is a better way to describe. Ordinals. I don't even like to call them Bitcoin NFTs. I don't think they are. Maybe, maybe proto NFTs, but I think that the free form it, it give, creates all these new use cases, and you have kind of hard media, hard data. You have these new opportunities where we, yes, it's good to take ideas from you know what's come before, especially on smart contract chains. All of that I think can be applied to what we're doing now, and it's a big opportunity there. But I think there's also this this durability use case where you know the person who inscribed 1984 they don't think they own the book now. They did that for humanity. And you think about Google, I don't know if you guys saw this, Google is now going to be shutting down all of the accounts that have been inactive on YouTube for more than two years. What happens to all that content? It's just gone. It's enormous, it's like burning the Library of Alexandria, but that's happening, okay? So I think there's going to be much more to do with durability and longevity, censorship resistance. I think everything where you need, where you need the durability, that's going to go eventually to Bitcoin or the Bitcoin layers. And that'll mean the financial assets will move there. And then I think you're going to have other lightweight use cases That'll find their way to things like Solana, where you have games, entertainment. You don't need the durability, you know, where you just need speed and interoperability, and that'll go somewhere else. So I think we're in kind of a new world now where we're going to see all sorts of extremely creative use cases come to Bitcoin that aren't possible necessarily on a smart contract chain. Yeah, absolutely. And I think with, with, uh, with all the excitement, it's sometimes uh, we forget the challenges that it takes to start building on Bitcoin in the first place. John, you've, you've worked on other blockchains. Perhaps you can tell us a little bit about what that experience was like uh, to start building on Bitcoin. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, that's something we had to go through because you know, we were on Stacks, and then we were on Solana, and then we were on Ethereum and Polygon. So you know, we've kind of been on these different chains. And on you know, smart contract chains, you have a lot more control over what's going to happen. I mean, it's kind of this interesting trade-off where Solidity is Turing complete, right? And Rust is Turing complete. And then Clarity is not intentionally, but it can still do a lot. And then Bitcoin is really not at all. But Bitcoin, it's like kind of a race car where it's optimized for these financial transactions. It's very limited in what it can do, but it's really optimized for that. And so we had to build around that. And it really took us a long time. And there are still unsolved problems. If anybody here is interested in DLCs, come see me because the Rust DLC package doesn't keep track of Satoshis. And that problem needs to be solved in order to like open up use, new use cases. So it really was a challenge. And that's why it took us you know, several months to get fully live on Bitcoin. Yeah, definitely. And, and Jamil, you, you started building on, on stacks, layer two, well, debatably layer two. Um, stack, yeah, big, a Bitcoin layer, let's say. Uh, so how was that transition uh, you know, for your team to, to start working with, with Bitcoin? Sure. Yeah, so I think if you come from a smart contract model, you're kind of used to this pattern. It's, it's really like the models are different, but it feels like coding in a traditional way, right? Like if you... Uh, no Python, you know C. It's it's very different. You have to like change your mental model when you're writing smart contracts. But generally, if you have an idea, you can you know write it into code, right? And uh, when you look at the UTXO model, it's it's quite different. You know, it's 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 not like you can think that way. It has its benefits too. Um, but for example, like if you wanted to do a smart contract in Solidity for a marketplace, you just sort of write out the logic for like here's how you deposit your NFT or here's how you you know. Uh, verify a signature that you want to list or set an approval uh, for how the smart contract can transfer your NFTs. Whereas on Bitcoin, you kind of set out a structure. Right? You're like, I have this inscription in this UTXO, so that's a transaction input. And the output is like one BTC. So it's kind of declarative. You're saying, here's my input, my input is my inscription, and my output is one BTC. And if you sign it with the right SIG hash type and get all the technicals right, then any buyer can come in take that partial transaction and fill it in with the rest of the inputs. So they can say like, okay, here's my payment, and then broadcast the transaction. It's very elegant, right? It's a very simple, even I talked to the Magic Eden uh, guys and they were like, yeah, this is like beautiful, right? We were, we were on Solana before with these smart contracts and like this is a beautiful way of doing things. It's inherently limiting, but in some ways that limiting, uh, that limiting uh, uh, constraints can also be quite powerful. Like if you read a, a Solidity smart contract, one of the famous examples is like the hash masks mint, which was one of the first big mints on Ethereum. It's like 10 lines of code for the mint function. You know how many bugs that thing has? Like it, it's, it's crazy, like reentrancy attacks, it had like off by ones and stuff like that. I mean, it was early, people were still figuring this thing out, 
But in Bitcoin, you have those constraints that allow you to set things up in such a simple and elegant way. Downside is a lot less tooling. So like for PSBTs, we were doing it before any open source, like open Ordex was open source and stuff like that. Basically, I like, locked myself in a room for two days to figure out how this, I, chat GPT didn't know what to do. <laughs> so, so like, I, I, you know, you're, you're figuring it sort of all out on your own. And even like Bitcoin script, right? Bitcoin is so powerful. Bitcoin script is so powerful. And, and there's almost no tooling to work with it. When I was trying to work with Bitcoin script stuff, I literally had like a piece of paper laid out on my table and I'm like popping things off the stack, writing op codes, like, you know, it's, it's like debugging in the 1960s. And uh, so I, I just think there's so much potential and Ordinals is really catalyzing this, this development of developer tools, of infrastructure like Xverse, of NeoSwap, of like everyone here on stage is like pushing, pushing that stuff forward. Um, but but it, yeah, right now it is painful. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's wild to think just a couple months ago, just a few months ago, like none of this infrastructure existed around ordinals. I mean, in fact, Xverse, of course, we didn't have this on our roadmap initially uh, for for 2023. Uh, you know, ordinals were were so so early, and we had to pivot and and totally focus all all of our energy and weekends, <laughs> sacrifice all our weekends to like make that happen. So, Robert, I know you guys recently launched Ordinals Market. How's that been? How's you know how's the adoption been so far? And and uh, and while we're on uh, around these challenges, uh, yeah, what what made you want to come to Ordinals, and, and what was that experience like? Yeah, for sure. Sorry, um, questions. <laughs> yeah, um, just to add on to what Jamil said, the yeah. the sort of two days in a room, you know, deeply empathize with that. You know, the the Bitcoin Punks launch was you know absolutely wild. You know, uh, just for a bit of context, uh, Bitcoin Punks are the sort of bite side, like the bite perfect crypto punks from ETH. Uh, and then bridged over to you know Bitcoin ordinals, and you know we threw a website. Uh, my co-founders threw a website uh, together, um, you know, in like a matter of like 24 hours. And then all of a sudden, we start seeing you know record spikes in inscriptions being created. This was around you know sort of 15, 20k inscription counts, and um, you know the rest is history. Um, we you know created ordinals market from that, and we didn't actually launch uh, ordinals market on. Bitcoin natively, because you know, again, the tech wasn't there. It just, it just simply wasn't. Um, so we actually partnered with uh, Emblem Vault. Uh, what they do is essentially uh, issue ETH NFTs, um, you know, and sort of wrap or you know, centralize, uh, centrally hold the uh, Bitcoin ordinals inside these NFTs. And you know, we enabled like an ETH uh, trading experience for those essentially. Um, but more recently, just uh, about a week ago, we launched uh, native uh, trustless uh, PSBT trading on Ordinal Stop Market. Um, the appetite's been really good. We, uh, I'm a little like sleepless today because we had the the first uh, native Bitcoin 12-fold sale on any marketplace yesterday. Uh, just really late last night, my uh, co-founder Anatoly, I was like, you know, just going to sleep here, and it came through, and we we're, you know, going going a little bananas. So amazing! Yeah. Congrats. Yeah, yeah, thanks. So it was uh, that was definitely wild. But um, I'd say the big thing about building on Bitcoin for now, at least, I know there there's a lot in the works to kind of solve these problems. Uh, is really like you know, kind of for us is the block times. Um, and, you know, there's a lot kind of introduced there. Uh, from a UX perspective, you've got like a host of front running issues. Because, you know, in, in sometimes up to an hour, a lot happens, you know, either off or on chain that could, you know, affect the value of that initial transaction that, you know, happened an hour ago, right? So now you have this sort of big UX problem of, of like how to handle, you know, situations like this where, you know, a user maybe buys a, an ordinal on your marketplace, and you know, in the you know subsequent you know 45 minutes, there's you know 100 other ones purchased from the collection, and then you know it, it's a very different landscape versus you know maybe 10, 20 second block times on on Ethereum. Yeah. Um, Wait till the miners discover MEV. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I know the guys at Luxor are thinking about that quite a lot. So, um, but yeah, like. These are all problems that can be solved. Again, Bitcoin's very resilient. It's been through a lot, like, and there's just a, a, a you know, and now an unprecedented amount of developer activity on this chain. So we're really excited about it. Um, but you know, lots of like problems that we're very eager eager to solve. Nice, yeah. And speaking of conge congestion, uh, Chris, I hope you don't mind if I throw a slight curveball your way. But I was I was speaking with somebody last night. 
and she was just really concerned about ordinals uh, congesting the Bitcoin blockchain and that this was going to, to cause harm to people um, around the world that are they're using blockchain. You know, I, I think there's, you know, Udi's been talking about, uh, people, you know, people, people dying uh, from, from this. And, you know, here we are having fun and inscribing JPEGs. And I just, you know, if, if this is something that you'd like to touch on, if not, if, if somebody else would like to, oh, yeah, to no, jump on that. But no. just how would you address somebody who has, who has these legitimate concerns? Look, it's, um, it, we're, it really we're figuring this out as we go. It's, it's a huge challenge, but it's a challenge we were going to have to face regardless if Bitcoin ends up doing what we all expect it to do. And it's, uh, you know, it's a priority stack of problems when it comes to developing the Bit Bitcoin network and a higher priority, in my opinion, you know, from you know, studying Bitcoin since I got into the space in 2017, the biggest risk on my mind, the like, most legitimate FUD out there was the security budget uh, through the, the havings to come. Uh, you know, eventually the fees have to reward the miners enough to continue to, uh, you know, invest in electricity to, to mint the blocks. Uh, that was that was one of the, you know, that was FUD that I feel like we didn't have a good answer to. Um, you know, of course, it was like, okay, a Bitcoin adoption will increase, fees will go up, but there was nothing to point to uh, as proof of that. And now we have that. You know, now it's pretty clear that uh, fees have potential to be significant even before we develop, you know, the transaction layer, uh, the pure monetary transaction layer of Bitcoin. So that FUD is out the window. And to me, that's like the biggest breath of fresh air that you know, I think we can all uh, appreciate. Okay, so now next layer of the priority stack Yes, uh, it has become more difficult, more expensive for everybody to transact in Bitcoin. So we can start to address that. Fortunately, you know, Lightning's been around for I don't know, five years, four years now. Uh, so we have that pretty well developed. Still some kinks to be figured out, no doubt. And we're figuring that out now as fees are elevated. Uh, we're figuring out that, okay, it's not so easy to, to onboard somebody onto a Lightning wallet, at least a non-custodial Lightning wallet, when fees are high. So how do we address this? Uh, but now we know. Like, you, you only figure out these problems as you experience them. Uh, so look, it's, it's, these are certainly addressable problems. I, I think it's pretty clear, and we've all known this is not a surprise. Like, to be using Bitcoin as you know, monetary transactions, at least for uh, relatively small amounts, the main chain is really just not the destination to do that. That's why we're building out Lightning. Lightning, and maybe, you know, it doesn't have to just be Lightning. There can be other layer twos uh, that, can, that can also develop as alternatives for transacting Bitcoin as money in a relatively cheap and practical way. So let's focus now on developing those. Absolutely. And John, I saw you're hopping out of your seat a bit on this one, too. So are our people, people dying, children crying? Where's, where's the Bitcoin love here? <laughs> yeah, that's funny. No, I totally just agree with what Chris said that, I mean, Bitcoin is like a tank and you're like driving your tank around and then you're surprised when the footbridge collapses. Like it just isn't meant for those purposes in the end. And I think the biggest problem with Bitcoin is solved now with, or at least potentially solved. You can look at the tooling and when you look at the fee problem, I mean, the long term security problem being solved, that's enormous. I mean, how can you say that you support Bitcoin and oppose ordinals? It doesn't really make any sense. Like, the things that are happening for Bitcoin are very, very positive, thanks to ordinals. And yes, there's going to be some growing pains, but really, you shouldn't have been using main chain Bitcoin to pay for coffee anyway. Like, that's not really long. It's going to be for settlements between banks or nation states or whatever. It's not going to be for, you know, me paying Elizabeth a few dollars for, you know, I don't know, whatever it might have been, like some coffee you bought me or whatever. That's not really the long-term use case of Bitcoin. That's for Lightning or other Layer 2s. Or stacks, you know, they have SBTC coming, SORs coming. So I think there's a lot of solutions coming that will solve some of the problems associated with the growing pains. Yeah, absolutely. And to touch further on that, uh, Jamil, what, what other challenges do you think we're going to need to overcome in regards to uh, the widespread adoption of Bitcoin NFTs? You know, there's, there's these different concerns, but, you know, in a, in a, in a larger view, what, what do you think... Uh, what do you think we can do? Yeah, I think to, to echo the uh, points by Chris and John, you know, I, I think the, the, the whole thesis of kind of this, this small block um, argument, which, you know, ha has played out very well, is that, you know, fee markets will rise, miners will get subsidized. Like, we saw the first 
block in I think like five years or something, and 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 that five years ago was just kind of a bug where the the fees exceeded the block subsidy. So you had like a seven BTC fees in a block, and the block subsidy was six point five. So you almost got like an excel uh, a, a taste of like what it's like in like 2040 or 2100 or whatever when um, when when the when the uh, when the block subsidies come down, um, and I think you not only see the demand and how much people are willing to pay for Bitcoin block space, but also the need to start thinking about Bitcoin layers and how you treat Bitcoin more as a settlement mechanism and more of like a, a clearing system rather than the medium that you use for every single transaction. Now, I don't think the perfect solution for that is out there yet. There's, of course, Liquid, there's Stacks, there's RSK, there's Lightning. And certainly all of them have, have their problems. But I think this is exactly what we need to do to push you know, the development of this sort of Cambrian explosion of L2s. And already you see so much work happening. Like trustless computer is another one that just popped up in, a, in the past couple months of doing like EVM on top of Bitcoin using, using inscriptions. Now, of course, I don't think that's a perfect solution either, but this is exactly the marketplace of ideas that makes Bitcoin so great, right? It's so like uh, the way I, I, I liken it is almost like to the, um, to the US Constitution, right? You have such a fundamental, unchanging, uh, very conservative base layer that's very hard to change, but so much innovation on top. The US is perhaps the most innovative country in the world, but with the least uh, changeable constitution right, in the world. Right? It's not just a piece of paper. It's a set of laws that we all adhere to, and it, 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 it's the fundamental base layer of our society. And similar to Bitcoin, you're seeing so much innovation and so much happen on top of Bitcoin without changing the protocol, without changing the base layer. So I think that Cambrian explosion of ideas is what I'm most excited about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Robert, just, uh, I know we have just a few minutes left, but did you want to add some thoughts to that? And then yeah, I'd like to have a absolutely. Uh, big plus one to the trustless computer guys. They've been you know, grinding for three months you know, ever since the explosion of ordinals and delivering some really top tier stuff. So definitely recommend checking them out. Um, you know, as far as like what problems we need to solve from a user perspective, you know, just kind of going back to that, um, you know, L2s, lightning, 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 you know, I think, you know, we all, we all see that coming, I think, you know, especially with, you know, inefficient protocols such as uh, BRC20, right, but the, you know, the headline is people like them, people like using them now, and, and people like using Bitcoin for apps, right, all of these apps that we've had across all the other chains for, for so long now, you know, ETH, Solana, etc., um, you know, they're being built and people are using them. They're paying, you know, in some cases, you know, 20, 30, 40 US dollars to, you know, send, uh, you know, a, it, whether that be a token, BRC20 token or, or a piece of, you know, art, right? Um, you know, going back to the security model again, that's extremely exciting for Bitcoin. And really, I think like it was the thing we're all waiting for. You know, I know everyone up here like feels the same way about that. Like it now Bitcoin is like, you know, the, the model like that Satoshi thought about, you know, when it, you know, way back in the day, like it's it's sort of coming to fruition with an app layer on top. So um. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like a L2 scalability solutions, this is the way to go. Uh, actually I was talking with Meeb yesterday and he was saying how at the Bitcoin Builders Conference at the very end he was in a circle with um, you know, the CEO of Light, Light Spark, so there was Lightning there and Rootstock and, and of course Stacks and just amazing that ordinals are, are bringing people together um, and even beyond that, you know, I think there's, there's we're creating bridges uh, between, you know, uh, New Year's from Ethereum and uh, and even uh, some, some perhaps some uh, maximalists out there, some purists. So it's just amazing to see what, what ordinals have done. So real quick, I uh, would love to uh, hear some closing thoughts uh, around where do you see the, the future of, of Bitcoin digital assets heading? Chris, perhaps we can start with you and work back down. I mean, it, it just, uh, my perspective changes every week, right? Uh, uh, Ordinals, it's developing so fast. Um, up until a, a couple weeks ago, my observation was, okay, the early inscriptions clearly have value in the eyes of collectors, but what else? We gotta find something else that people value, otherwise eventually the, the early ones won't have value either. Uh, but you know, be careful what you wish for because now, <laughs> now we have shit coins on, on ordinals which people value. Uh, so it, that to me, you know, it's not what we're into, but it's, it's clear that uh, the, because of that demand, the infrastructure on ordinals will continue to develop and I think that's most important for the protocol. Uh, on the art side, it's going to be super interesting to see, you know, what type of art gets inscribed in a higher fee environment. Uh, so I think, you know, we've experienced probably the golden age of inscribing 
uh, up until a month ago where you could inscribe for relatively low fees. And now anything on the art side, it's going to have to be something that people really, really value, which is also interesting. It's just a di different uh, ecosystem that we're going to be facing. Yeah, um, you know, totally agree. Uh, I think, you know, if I was to close with kind of one thing, um, you know, it's definitely just to embrace the crazy, wild app ideas that come to Bitcoin. You know, the BRC20s of the world, you know, I know people love them, people hate them. Same with art, frankly, and I'm sure there'll be, you know, a hundred more in the next, like, few months here. Um, I'd say, you know, stay curious, stay hungry, and I think, like, you know, all of, the, all of these apps will you know, secure Bitcoin and, um, you know, the developer activity will follow as well, so. Yeah, I think one thing that's been really cool to see has been sort of the consolidation of everybody starting to build on this common layer, you know, like we had Scarce City build on Counterparty, you know, uh, first, we had, you know, um, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ordinal's market starting on Ethereum. Uh, you had, you know, John and I starting on Stacks, and we're all sort of building on the same infrastructure, the same layers now, and building building towards a common goal. What I do want to see next is um, we sort of cop, as I mentioned before, like copied some of these patterns from Ethereum and from other chains, and sort of our marketplaces kind of follow similar patterns. And I'm interested to see like how do we lean into Bitcoin's unique value proposition and start to develop our own culture and our own way of doing things and start to you know fine tune and, and, and grow into our own. It almost feels like not to use the, the American metaphor again, but like you know the, the the in the days of like the 13 colonies where you bring in culture from uh, your, your your sort of immigrant lands and now start to develop your own. Uh, ordinals culture and your own ordinals, um, you know, um, uh, uh, values, right? Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, that that is fascinating. You know, um, it's interesting. You know, jazz is the only native like American music, and it really is this idea that you have minimal structure and then people can collaborate. And actually, I think ordinals are like that, where it's kind of minimal structure, a very free form. You know, there's, it's mo more unstructured than smart contract chains. And I think on smart contract chains, you know, you have this a lot of concern about ownership, right? Publicly verifiable digital ownership is kind of the value prop of Web3. But actually, ordinals goes beyond, they go beyond that because of the artifacts. You have hard media, hard data. And so I think you're going to see these use cases that really go beyond what we're used to in Web3. So if I were to guess on the future, I would say things where we care about durability, where we want censorship resistance, that's going to go to Bitcoin. And then I think you're going to have lightweight Web3 applications that go elsewhere because there's no reason for them to need to be so durable. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much all for being here today. Please, uh, during the break and, and just around, feel free to come up and connect with our panelists. Uh, we're here to chat with you and uh, here to answer any questions you have uh, and, and particularly around you know, any, any int uh, integrations and, and ideas and thoughts. Uh, so yeah, thanks, thanks for having us today. And I'll go ahead and go off to the next panel.